My name is Sundaram. I am associated as a researcher with Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace in India, uh, CNPP. It's a coalition of grassroots anti-nuclear and peace movements which came about in the aftermath of the nuclear test in 1998. And it has been active for more than a decade now uh, for nuclear disarmament and also with grassroots anti-nuclear energy protests. Uh, and these protests are happening all over the country. In several places where the government is uh, planning new reactors, they are very strong, massive, but entirely thoroughly peaceful people's protests in India and several parts of the country. In the southern mass, uh, most tip of the country, you have a place called Kudankulam, which was recently uh, in news for massive protests. Similar protests are happening on the western coast. You have a place called Jaitapur. You have Michi Vendi, where American reactors are being set up. We do have Kovara uh, on the eastern coast, where Westinghouse reactors are being set up. So Indian government is one of the few governments which is going for a massive, massive expansion of nuclear energy uh, after Fukushima, which is an aberration, which is an anachronism, because there's a global shift away from nuclear, as you would see post-Fukushima. Uh, maybe I will talk about it uh, a little bit more later. Uh, uh, I am here on a trip to organize, to mobilize solidarity against the proposed India-Japan nuclear agreement, which has been in pipeline for several years now. Uh, <clears throat> apart from Tokyo, I'll be visiting Osaka for a conference in the next two days. Uh, then I'll be going to Hiroshima and also Fukushima. Uh, then I'll be back in Tokyo and join the Friday 8th uh, protest in front of the Prime Minister's residence. Uh, so the idea is to reach out to as many uh, people as possible, citizens group, activist groups, and to highlight uh, what are the implications of this uh, nuclear agreement for India and in general internationally. So very briefly about the movement, what are the, uh, what are the problems with the agreement that we are trying to highlight? Uh, one is the problem nationally, one set of problems which pertain to problems in India and there are other set of problems which uh, highlight uh, why this uh, deal should be objectionable at the international level as well. Uh, on, on the Indian side, uh, one has to understand that this is slightly more than being a bilateral deal. India, after 2005, after its nuclear Pagia status was uh, exempted and it was mainstream, as, well, as you would know, that there was an international embargo, a ban against having nuclear cooperation with India, which lasted for more than 35 years, which started when India conducted nuclear tests in 1974, for which it used the technology, know-how, uh, human resources that it got from, under peaceful rubric from the West in 50s and 60s. So after that, there was a ban on India, which was lifted in 2005-2008 by the Bush administration. It helped uh, India getting exemption from the uh, from those restrictions. And after that, India has entered into bilateral nuclear agreement with a number of countries, including France, Canada, US, Russia, Nigeria, uh, Kazakhstan. It's trying to have an agreement with Australia. So everything who has something nuclear, India is trying to have an agreement with them. That, that country. Uh, but the Japanese agreement is slightly more than a bilateral, as I said. Why? Because uh, as of now, there are no concrete proposals of uh, Japanese companies uh, selling turnkey reactors to India. The Japanese agreement is important because very crucial components which Japanese manufacturers companies manufactures are going to be used in American reactors which are being set up in Kovara in Andhra Pradesh on the western coast of India and which will be on the eastern coast of India where GE, General Electricals, is building four massive reactors. And as you know, both these countries, GE and Westinghouse, also require a bilateral agreement between India and Japan because effectively they have become uh, uh, companies with major Japanese shareholding. So GE has become GE Hitachi, and Westinghouse has become Westinghouse Toshima. Uh, the, the French company Areva, which is setting up a massive reactor, in fact, this is going to be the world's biggest reactor in Chaitapur, in Maharashtra, western coast of India. It's uh, very close to Mumbai, Bombay. Uh, there also, in that reactor also, some very crucial Japanese components uh, in the wall, in the, in the reactor vessel, will be manufactured by the Japanese companies. So to facilitate, to, for, for these 
French and American reactors to take off on the ground, these companies require a bilateral agreement between India and Japan. And hence, these companies and their governments have been uh, pressuring the Japanese government to have an agreement as soon as possible. Because in lack of this agreement, their projects are stuck. Uh, secondly, uh, it's also very important because uh, the whole process of India going in for so many bilateral agreements and for so many uh, nuclear purchases uh, had very little to do with the energy requirement, although it was peddled uh, post facto as a justification for these deals. What happened in, uh, behind these agreements is this, that Indian, Indian government, when it conducted nuclear tests in 1998, uh, it faced another round of sanctions, right? And since 74 test also it was under ban. So it wanted those restrictions to be lifted and in exchange for these exemptions, it, uh, it came up with uh, advanced purchase promises to all these countries to buy these reactors. So these reactors are being bought and being set up in India in exchange for legitimacy for India's nuclear weapons status. This is very, very important because uh, you know, the 74 tests invited uh, in banks and moratorium which lasted for more than three decades. But the 1998 tests, you would see that the response of the international community led by US was slightly different because by then India had become a major consumer market for the goods of the American companies because uh, Geostrategically, India was now more important in the Asian game of containing China and the war on terror in which uh, US then was indulging in Iraq and Afghanistan and all. So India was too important to be left out. And hence, the 1998 test, in, in a total reversal, uh, kind of uh, attracted a different response. And there was a mainstreaming of the India's nuclear weapons. There was a legitimacy of Indian nuclear weapons. And because the Indian government, the Indian elite, uh, was too attracted to becoming a superpower, becoming a nuclear weapons power, and becoming a legitimate nuclear power, that it agreed to have all these reactor purchases, and which brings to the question that these reactor purchases are happening in India without any uh, cost comparison, without any uh, real rational understanding of how much energy India needs and how much it, of it would come should come from nuclear and so on. Uh, without uh, looking at the safety procedure and their implementation in a post Fukushima world. In fact, India is one of the few countries which has further diluted its safety norms because without diluting even the existing very loose regulator that we have been criticizing from the beginning, uh, it cannot implement these reactors on the ground. Similarly, uh, this implementation, the implementation of the new proposed uh, nuclear power plants is happening by brutally crushing people's resistance on the ground. Because, as you know, India is a very densely populated country. Uh, there are farmers, there are fisher folk, and these are most vulnerable sections of Indian society. We have tens of thousands of people who are going to be affected from this insane nuclear expansion drive, and they are up in arms totally non-violent. These uh, movements are happening for the last five, seven years, and not a single case of violence from the side of people's movement has occurred. So very vulnerable, poor people, mostly from farmers, women, you know, rural women, because their livelihoods are at stake, and wherever a family is displaced from village to uh, urban centers, women, it's very difficult for them to co up with a totally different uh, cultural milieu. So you will see that in this grassroots movements, massive, massive movements, women have played a very, very important role. And they have faced brutal depression. As we are speaking here today, in Kudankula, more than 5,000 people are facing fictitious charges of sedition, war against the Indian state, which is absurd. Indian government declares anybody anti-national when you oppose a nuclear power plant peacefully. Uh, apart from these big charges of sedition and all, uh, very fictitious cases of murder, attempt to murder, uh, destroying you know, private property and, and so on and so forth have been leveled against absurdly large number of protested un protesters, unnamed faces, not 10,000 people and, and like that. Uh, in Kudankulam, but also in Jaitapur, in Michigan, in Chutka, everywhere. So the nuclear expansion in India is happening 
post Fukushima in a totally anachronistic fashion when there is a global shift or at least a rethink on nuclear issues. Uh, and Indian government, because its weapons have been legitimized, in exchange it is the setting up these reactors, pushing them under the throat of its vulnerable people who are losing their livelihood, who have very, very legitimate concerns about safety of these reactors, like the French um, project in Jaipur. It's a totally new design of reactor. Uh, it's an EPR, European Pressurized Reactor, which is nowhere else being built. Uh, the only place they are building it is in Finland, where it has run into huge uh, cost overruns, and the Finnish regulator after Fukushima has, uh, has actually taken Areva to the court. They are litigation, they are fighting litigation there for safety issues. But in India, it's, it's all okay. Similarly with the American uh, in, you know, imported reactors. So all these reactors are being set up by crushing uh, grassroots protest, by further diluting the existing very, very loose uh, regulatory norms, by uh, further insulating the nuclear industry. The, uh, the Indian setup has something called Right to Information Act, and it provided some access. You can uh, put a Right to Information query to government departments and ask about their budget, their procedures, and so on and so forth. But there is an attempt that the Right to Information Act would be diluted and the nuclear sector would be granted a complete uh, insulation from any public scrutiny. Similarly, in 2010, you had a system, we, we have a law, Nuclear Liability Act, which uh, we have been critical because it's uh, very loose and, uh, and actually caps caps the limit of liability in case of an accident. But there is a very small hook on the suppliers, the foreign suppliers. Uh, the condition 17B says that uh, in case of an accident, the operator can choose to sue the suppliers. It has a right of recourse against the suppliers. And uh, in case of the imported reactors, the Russian companies, the American companies, the French company Areva, all of them have unanimously said, no, we will not abide by this act, and the Indian government should uh, change, should amend the act, which is passed by the Indian parliament. It's a question of sovereignty of Indian people. And when this uh, when this legislation was under discussion in India, uh, we were, um, we had a very heated, very animated discussion, because in India, A, the whole governmental setup of dealing with an accident, large scale accident, is totally unreliable. Even after 30 years, the victims of Bhopal, 1984, which was a chemical uh, accident, much low, smaller than a nuclear accident would be, are still waiting for compensation, redress, and rehabilitation, and so on. So that was the backdrop in which the Nuclear Liability Act was legislated in India, and the foreign corporations are pushing that the government of India should dilute, should amend this act to accommodate what they think is their concern, that they should be let off. Uh, this Japanese agreement would, of course, further uh, reinforce that demand. The government is under immense pressure. The new uh, prime minister uh, will be visiting US as well in September. And we are apprehensive that one of the key things which he would offer to US as a gift um, would be the dilution of the Nuclear Liability Act. The earlier Prime Minister also tried his best to do that, uh, but it, because it was a government based on, uh, it was a coalition government which had party, uh, all sorts of parties, so it was very difficult for him to get it through in the parliament. But the corporate party this time believes that the Modi government will be able to do that because he has group majority in the parliament this time. Uh, so these are the concerns uh, which Indian people have regarding the expansion of nuclear energy uh, in India. Uh, and these are very, very genuine concerns. Uh, so you would see that not only at the grassroots, we have protests, the grassroots protests are uh, obviously, they stem from uh, more immediate concerns of safety and livelihood, uh, site-specific issues of safety of these designs, reactors, and so on. But in the general society, the intellectuals, uh, the, the general civil society activists, uh, and democrat voices who would, uh, who are still ambivalent about whether we should go for nuclear or not, the larger nuclear question, but even they were stunned by the brutal repression that these movements had to face over now. Even they were stunned by the brutal denial of democratic space for these movements, by the brutal denial of transparency and minimum accountability. 
Even you could say that within the government, within the government, the controller and editor general of India, which is the uh, highest auditor in India, raised very, very specific and very severe questions in the way nuclear uh, regulation happens in India. Right? When the government was legislating this Nuclear Liability Act, secretaries from eight ministries, ranging for Home Ministry to Health Ministry and so on, they said we are simply not in a position to deal with a nuclear accident. So even within government, there have been uh, voices critical of the way in which this, this expansion is happening, uh, even if they might be in favor of nuclear, but this current model of expanding nuclear energy, uh, they have, there have been divergent voices within the system itself. Uh, you would uh, also uh, you know, notice that the uh, the earlier Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Manmohan Singh, he was finance minister in nine, early 90s in India and as an economist, as a finance minister, he actually put the Nuclear Power Corporation to the book and he said, uh, he reduced their budget, he tried to make them accountable and more auditable. So, but as a, as a Prime Minister, as a political head, it suddenly started making sense for him to give the nuclear power corporation more leeway to go for further expansion and so on. So, uh, the important point here to note is that the nuclear expansion in India is happening for pure diplomatic reasons, for pure diplomatic imperatives, and hence all the democratic norms, all the safety concerns, all the progress of the peoples uh, at the grassroots and in the urban centers as well are kept up there. Brutal. and but but this has not uh, really stopped the protest. The protests are even ongoing. When your uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe he visited India in January this year, we had very strong protests in several cities of India. Uh, apart from these places where grassroots, these villages where grassroots protests are happening, we had uh, protests in Delhi, in Bombay, in Calcutta, in several cities, in Bangalore. And uh, people came out and said, Mr. Shinzo Abe, you are welcome to India, but nukes are not. That was our slogan. And we had thousands of people coming and protesting against Mr. Shinzo Abe. So the protests are still ongoing. They are very, very strong. And we are against uh, this insane, anachronistic, undemocratic, unsafe, uh, unaccountable, uneconomic expansion of nuclear energy. And the agreement with Japan would be a disaster. It would also be a disaster in the sense that uh, when the mainstreaming of Indian nuclear weapon status was happening uh, between 2005 and 2008, uh, led by and, and engineered by the Bush administration in the US, uh, Japan was among the few countries which were still slightly reluctant to legitimize India. Mm -hmm. uh, despite uh, objections of Japan and also a range of other countries in the nuclear suppliers group, like um, New Zealand, Austria, Australia to, uh, some, to some extent, and several other smaller countries, the nuclear suppliers group exempted, uh, granted an exemption from its own rules, which prohibited earlier uh, any country against, uh, prohibited from nuclear commerce if the country has not signed CTBT and NPT. Uh, so it will be a complete uh, reversal from that diplomatic posture, and Japan granting Legitimacy to India's nuclear weapons would be an ultimate embrace of this insane nuclear power in India, nuclear superpower and whatnot in the international system. And it sets a very, very wrong precedent. It sets a wrong precedent when the world is concerned about dilution of NPT, when the world is concerned about how to deal with cases like Iran, North Korea and others who are further going for proliferation and they are N number of that, at least the IAH system says there are more than 25 countries who are waiting, waiting to proliferate. They have the wherewithals, they have the technology, material and everything. But the NP system so far, despite all its other limitations, it has been able to you know, stop proliferation. But here in a world which is dealing with further proliferators, potential proliferators, which is dealing with cases like Iran, you have a country like India which has been rewarded for going neutral because it is close to the US-led international system, because uh, it's, a, it's an ally of the US. So you have good news, Indian nukes are good news, Pakistani nukes are bad news, potential Iranian nukes are bad news. So this deal, this, this process of legitimizing India's nuclear weapons creates pressure in the international NPT system itself, and it's a very, very bad precedent for global disarmament. 
So on both accounts, on the count of global disarmament, this is a bad, bad precedent. This has very deep, um, you know, worrying implications. And on the count of nuclear energy, it's pushing for an insane, expensive, dangerous nuclear expansion in India, uh, which will cost, which will uh, unleash horror on the most vulnerable sections of Indian society, which are, who are voiceless, whose voice are just not listened by the Indian government and the mainstream media and the mainstream society as well. Because in India, as I say, it's a third world country and they are obsessed with a particular model of growth and national prosperity and so on. And for that, they think we need lots of energy, we need nuclear energy and so on. So on both these counts, the India-Japan agreement would strike a blow to the concerns that we have been raising, consistently facing state repression. Uh, it will uh, create bad precedent. And you, uh, apart from these concerns, I think also it should be highlighted that in the international uh, system, post Fukushima, when most of these uh, big nuclear giant companies are facing uh, losses, are forced in several countries to reverse their uh, market share and so on, to reverse the expansion. And for instance, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland have mandated a reversal of their nuclear policy. In such an international scenario, kind of provide a space to recoup their financial health. Uh, Areva is going to gain hugely from Areva is a French company whose shares, whose Profits are dwindling over the last five, seven years. It's in a bad shape financially, but it's for it's the Indian deal is very, very important. So the post Fukushima, I think the Japanese Indian mutual agreement would in in a very important and a very worrying fashion would turn the clock back internationally on the expansion of nuclear sector, uh, nuclear energy post Fukushima. It will provide a new energy to these corporates whose profits have been falling over the last few years. Uh, so for all these concerns, we have been strongly against uh, the India Japan nuclear agreement. These are concerns which have been uh, raised by the people, the villagers of India, the democratic people of India. And when we had protests in India against Mr. Shinzo Abe's visit, uh, we had friends in Tokyo, Osaka also, which came out and uh, participated and joined our protests. So we have had uh, very strong solidarity from the Japanese movement also. So it's not a question of Indian citizens, it's a question of both Indian and Japanese citizens. It's a question of citizens uh, of other countries internationally who have come against uh, nuclear expansion, nuclear power in general after Fukushima. So I would most humbly request you to uh, help us in raising our voice, help us in reaching out to as many people as possible through your media. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.